Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, good morning and good evening, depending where you are. A very warm welcome to today's webinar, where we're going to be discussing the content of our latest report on the development of the international bond markets of Asia. And it's really my pleasure to say a few brief words to open this afternoon's event to set the scene for our discussion. <clears throat> the report we're discussing today clearly highlights the growing importance of the capital markets of Asia and how Asian credits are rapidly becoming more accessible for international issuers and for international investors. It builds on our earlier work looking at developments in the region Notably, this year, our study on the internationalization of the China corporate bond markets, which focuses on China's domestic renminbi markets and the offshore, primarily US do dollar denominated corporate bond markets. And also our 2018 study, the Asia Pacific cross border bond, corporate bond secondary market. Firstly, I'd like to thank the HKMA both for their skilled and knowledgeable support in preparing this report and for their long-term involvement and assistance in the work of our association across all areas of the international capital markets. And over the years, the HKMA has been particularly helpful in our efforts to encourage credible standards and new issuance in the sustainable debt markets. We've been very happy to partner with them to run a series of extremely successful sustainable finance conferences in the past years. And I very much hope that we'll be able to resume these in the near future as the pandemic recedes. I'd also like to thank Bloomberg, Dealogic, Equilend, IHS Market and Market Access, all of whom generously contributed quantitative data and analysis that is so crucial to understand the dynamics of the market and the trends contributing to its growth. Let me also thank the many market participants, investors, intermediaries, and infrastructure participants in particular, who shared their valuable time and expertise in the qualitative interviews conducted in our research. And last but not least, my colleagues, and in particular, Andy Hill, Mushtaq Kapazi, Yan Xing Zha, who have put enormous effort into compiling this report and we'll be hearing from them later. We all see the potential of the Asian bond markets as a complement to the markets of the USA and Europe and which can in time rival them for depth and liquidity. And this report demonstrates that that work is well underway and the rapid progress being made. Even before we first established our Asia Pacific office in Hong Kong, some seven years ago, connecting the Asian bond markets with the rest of the world has been the long-term goal to which we've been working. We share our expertise on best market practices and international regulation derived from decades of activity in the international capital markets with our growing and active Asian membership. And across Asia, we've been privileged to enjoy fruitful in-depth relationships with regulatory authorities and central banks, as they've increasingly appreciated the importance of the bond markets in funding economic and development projects for their economic growth and ultimately for the benefit of their citizens. In China in particular, with the help of our growing membership on the mainland, we've been engaged in a lengthy and productive relationship with the authorities, largely through NAFMI, as China has progressively internationalized its onshore and off offshore bond markets, with the resulting activity that we'll be hearing more about today. A clear conclusion of our research is that the growth of the Asian cross-border markets has been driven most importantly by flows in and out of China, and Hong Kong is well-placed to continue a to play a leading role as the intermediary and broker between the mainland and the international markets. At today's event, we're taking a broad view of the debt securities markets and we won't be making specific references to ESG bond markets, which have become increasingly a central feature of any discussion on bond markets and where Asia is, of course, a leader in the field. However, I think we can at this stage of progress take it as read 
that sustainable debt issuance is now central to any discussion about the health and growth of bond markets more generally. And it goes without saying that the bond markets are crucial to raising the levels of private finance that we need to deliver on the urgent priority of the Paris climate change agenda and to mitigate the socioeconomic issues which have been highlighted and aggravated by the ongoing pandemic of the last year. So in summary, the subject of this report is of the greatest possible interest to us at ICMA and it's at the core of our commitment to integrated and efficient cross-border bond markets. We intend to continue this regional research in cooperation with the HKMA in the years to come. So I might also mention this report represents only a beginning. With the lessons learned from this research and your feedback from the market, we are intending to expand on the themes and the analysis of the regional cross-border bond markets. And so we are looking forward to working constructively with the HKMA on another report next year and hopefully in the years to come after that. Before we move to our discussion on the highlights of the research, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker from the HKMA. As I've already remarked, Hong Kong is the gateway to the Chinese capital markets and a leader and a pioneer in ESG. We are de therefore delighted today to welcome Kenneth Hui, Head of Market Development at the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. We've enjoyed a long and fruitful collaboration personally with Kenneth, particularly in the area of sustainable finance, and are looking forward to continuing this cooperation in the future. Kenneth, welcome. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for your support. And we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, thank you, Martin. And thank you for you and for ICMA uh, for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to speak to you all here. Um, I'd like to first congratulate ICMA for the publication of the report. Um, my team and I are very glad that the report has been produced. Over the years, policymakers have really struggled to properly understand the bond market. Uh, because of its OTC nature, meaningful data about bond issuance, trading and investing have been very difficult to come by. Added to the complexity is the international nature of the market. Uh, where an issuance typically involves a ranges team of origination, syndication, trading, and sales across multiple continents. The difference between where a trade takes place and where it is booked at another headache. Then there is the association of listing with trading. The association is pretty ingrained in people's mind because this is how equity market works, from IPO directly to secondary market trading. But listing means something completely different in bond. Um, and then finally, as e-trading becomes more popular, where servers are located and how that affects the operations of dealers and investors alike is one extra question that we have to grapple with. All these may sound pretty unremarkable to those in the industry, but you know, try explaining this to the public or going one step further to try applying a jurisdictional framework on the market and then come up with policy to promote the development of the market of a particular location, just like what we at the HKMA and our fellow central banks or supervisors in other places have to do. Um, as you could imagine, this is a pretty daunting task. The ICMA paper has provided a conceptual framework supported by data to go about this analysis. And I think I speak for many in finding such work illuminating. The, the report is also very timely in light of the rapid rise of the Asian bond market, as uh, Martin has already explained, and as will be further discussed at the uh, presentation that follows. Um, annual issuance of cross-border bonds from Asia has increased more than fivefold in the past 15 years. It's now nearly 600 billion US dollar. Issuance in China in particular has surged and now accounts for 40% of international issuance in the region. And despite the rapid growth, the small absolute size of the market as compared to US and Europe suggests that there is further room for growth. The investor base as well has been shifting. Historically, um, Asian bond investors have been very kind of local, focusing on the underlying credit that they're familiar with. But the search for better return as well as the inclusion of Asian sovereigns and credits in major bond indices have attracted international investment flow into Asia. 
the demand for Asian bond by international real money investors is expected to continue to grow in the years to come as well. Here in Hong Kong and at the HKMA, we're thinking hard about how to help promote the development of the Asian bond market, such as through Bond Connect, grant scheme, and tax incentives. Uh, in fact, featuring some findings from this ICMA report, our Chief Executive Eddie Yu published a blog post yesterday uh, on the Hong Kong bond market covering multiple policy initiatives. I won't cover them here, but for those of you that are interested, I encourage you to take a look at the, uh, at, at the HKMA website. Once again, congratulations and thank you, ICMA. Um, without further ado, I'll now pass the floor back to our host, and I look forward to Mushtaq and Andy's presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Kenneth, for your remarks. I would now like to invite my colleagues, Andy Hill, Senior Director at ICMA, and Mushtaq Kapasi, Head of Asia Pacific at ICMA, to begin their presentation. Well, thank you, Leanne, and thank you, everybody. Um, before we go into the findings of the report, I'll just very briefly provide a, a, a little bit of background to build on, on the comments already made by, by Martin and, and Kenneth. The focus of the report is very much the international offshore Asian bond market. And as, as Kenneth said, it aims to provide a, a conceptual overview of the market, focusing on development and, and trends. The report looks in depth um, very much at the, the primary market, but also takes an overview of secondary market structure. As previously mentioned, it builds on quantitative analysis, which is kindly provided by a number of data sources, um, but also, and very importantly, qualitative input from selective market participants. And the qualitative input came very much through semi-structured interviews with, with relevant institutions, including regional banks, investors, trading venues, market infrastructures. Uh, it's also important to, to once again uh, mention the, the, the great support that we had from HKMA in, in putting this report together, both in terms of quantitative data collection and analysis, but also guidance on the, on the overall themes. So, Mushtaq, I think it would be, it, we'll, we'll, we'll start off with you on, the, on the, the primary aspects of the report and, and maybe kick off with a, a very general question, which is, what have been the main drivers for, for growth in the Asian international bond market? Sure, Andy. Well, thanks for the introduction. And uh, again, thanks for all of your insights in putting this, uh, this massive work together. So actually, if you don't mind, Andy, I'll just back up and give a brief comment on the methodology, but also give a bit of um, uh, quantitative context to the, the big growth headline numbers that we've seen. So some in the audience might be curious, what does international bonds actually mean? Um, and um, it's a fairly straightforward definition. Um, that's applied by uh, the main data source that we use, DealLogic. It's basically issues that are sold in a foreign market, um, in the Euro market or globally. So this is determined deal by deal um, using DealLogic methodology, which is pretty much um, industry standard. So it's basically cross-border issuance. We're not looking at domestic markets here and particularly not the domestic markets. One other uh, thing to note is that we're talking about Asia only. So it's um, not including um, Australia and, and New Zealand, but it, yes, including uh, Japan. So just get those out of the way. Now, the big number that we, we cite uh, here, um, the kind of basic number is, is that the is annual issuance in Asian bond markets, Asian international bond markets, has more than quintupled from 2006 to 2020. And our paper goes into a lot of interesting detail about um, the numbers behind that growth. But I thought it might be useful to take a step even farther back and look at, well, okay, the market has increased five times. Um, what does that look like in terms of comparison with the rest of the world? And what does that look like in terms of the overall growth of Asian economies? So just to run some quick numbers here, the Asian GDP from 2006 to 2020 um, increased by two to three times. So basically uh, growth of 150%. It's two and a half times bigger now than it was 15 years ago. But the bond market, the international bond market, 
is more than five times as big as it was uh, 15 years ago. So the bond market has actually grown as a, as a function of overall GDP growth. When you look at the world as a whole, however, the numbers are about the same. So the international bond market for the globally, including the US, Oceania, and, and the EU, has grown up at about the same rate in aggregate um, as uh, the GDP of the world has grown. So we're actually, actually seeing a growth of the market um, relative to the overall um, economies. Now, another interesting thing is just to look at um, China in particular, which now represents about 40% of international um, bond issuance out of Asia. Back 15 years ago, the international bond market out of China basically did not exist. It was less than 10 billion um, US dollars in equivalent. And now um, it is um, more than 250, sorry, 250 billion uh, US dollars representing about 40% of, of the total issuance. So it's really gone from almost nothing to a very significant part of Asia. Um, the domestic bond market did exist quite significantly back uh, 15 years ago, and that has about doubled in size, but the international market has grown enormously. And one final uh, interesting um, tidbit that I'll, I'll share um, for the audience is just looking at the global share of the international bond market by region. So in Asia, um, as been remarked by, uh, by Mr. Hoy and by, by Martin, Asia still represents a relatively small proportion of the overall global market around 10%. And Europe and US still account for, for the bulk of that. But we have seen generally a lowering of the share of the EU over time and an increase in the share of US over time. That, that kind of mix between the three regions has been relatively steady over the last four years or so. And most of the change of that with Asia rising, Europe falling and US rising a little bit as well occurred between 2009 and 2015. Okay, I hope that was interesting um, just to give some context, but let me get back to your question, um, Andy, on the main drivers of this. So apart from just the general growth in the economies as a whole, of course, um, we are seeing the from our uh, qualitative interviews with the market, we've seen a number of different drivers for um, issuers in domestic Asian markets to go to the international markets. And um, I'll outline a couple of these. So they're fairly obvious. One is meeting foreign currency funding needs. If you have operations um, outside of your home country, so in particular, Chinese companies expanding their operations abroad, then in some cases, it's better, more convenient to actually go to the international markets to raise funds in those currencies. Another very important reason is managing your funding costs and your liability structure, diversifying funding channels and your investor base. So sometimes going to the international markets, issuing in another currency that you need to use, using the swap markets, for example, can actually be beneficial for your bottom line just from a corporate treasury point of view. And what we've seen is that as issuers get more sophisticated in the domestic markets, then they start to understand the various options open to them in the international market, and they become more skilled at tapping the international market in a, in a, a very strategic way in order to improve their overall um, funding. And last but not least, and I think this has actually been important, particularly for uh, the growth in China issuance, is raising profile in the international market. So especially in the early days, when I say early days, I mean about 10 years ago, um, in the earlier days, um, you would see a number of benchmark issuances from uh, Chinese um, companies, Chinese issuers that wanted to make a, a splash, um, you know, that wanted to become recognizable um, in the international investor community and in the international finance world. And so that was another reason, another contributing reason for, um, for Asian international issuance to, to increase. Now, it's not just from the issuer side. I should also mention that it's also very important to note that the demand from the investor side, the international investor side, has also contributed to this growth. So it's only part of the reason is that as EM desks um, in emerging market desks around the world have looked for more diversification, have looked for um, better yields, especially in the current environment, but also in other low interest rate environments. Um, they've increasingly looked to Asia um, for that diversification and for that yield. And so without the demand itself, 
there would be nothing for issuers to issue and they wouldn't find it attractive. So it's really a combination of those two factors um, that has generally led to the growth. Okay, well, thanks, Mishtak. I mean, maybe it would be a good point to, to perhaps look at some of the, the observable trends with, um, with respect to arranging, executing, and listing of deals. Sure, so we analyze this as well, um, again, using the deal logic data. And um, okay, I'll talk a little bit about uh, arrangement here. And um, we thought this would be interesting just in terms of looking at where a deal is done. Now, it's, it's an, I would say it's an art, not a science um, to determine this, but I think we have a fairly rigorous uh, methodology that we employed, which is basically looking at the, the underwriters on the deal, um, looking at their location, and if 50% of them were in one location, then we would consider that as the um, as a location of, of arrangement. So this is looking at the headline headline banks on the deal, the headline intermediaries. If there were not any banks that uh, were, I'm sorry, if there were not only locations that had more than 50% of the um, of the of the underwriters on the deal, then we would list that as a um, consortium. So based on that, we were able to do a um, a geographical analysis um, with some rigor. And the main point I think that is interesting out of this data analysis is that Asian financial centers have played a larger role and gained market share in arrangement and listing. Um, 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, it was almost exclusively the province of uh, London, New York, to some extent Tokyo as well, that were the uh, centers where the deals were actually put together, where the documentation was done, um, where the, you know, the nitty gritty work of getting the deal through um, through the door and get the bonds out to investors um, where that work was done. But increasingly, especially Hong Kong and Singapore have played um, a larger and larger role in the share of issuing international bonds from an arrangement and execution standpoint. Um, we did ask our uh, constituents, um, those we interviewed, you know, what are the reasons why a deal gets arranged in, in a particular place? And there are actually a number of reasons for that. I think at a very basic level, um, a financial center or a particular place has to have a very a minimum of um, uh, regulatory certainty, of legal certainty, of efficiency of market infrastructure, and a pool of talent. So that's extremely important. But also what's very important is proximity to the investor base and um, connections to the actual issuers. So for, I think those latter two reasons, Asia has been um, uh, kind of rising up in, in the market share and um, particularly Hong Kong and Singapore, they've already been considered very um, le legitimate, um, um, a good kind of legal certainty kind of place. Um, and so for those reasons, they've been well poised to, uh, to be the arranging um, centers. Now I, I must uh, mention, um, it's not necessarily in the paper because it comes, these are things that happen close to uh, close to press time, but we're very much aware of the um, latest proposed reforms by the Hong Kong SFC um, in terms of arranging and book building processes. So this could be a very interesting factor um, in terms of um, affecting the way that deals are done um, in Hong Kong. And ICMA is extremely active in speaking to the markets um, and analyzing the proposals from the SFC to see how they could help um, improve the way that deals are put together and distributed um, out of Hong Kong and by um, Hong Kong uh, Hong Kong regulated entities. So um, we think this is an opportunity. We welcome the the intent of the SFC to make um, these uh, deals out of Hong Kong uh, much more efficient, much more compliant, much more fair to everyone involved. And we're looking very carefully at the proposal, and we'll come back with detailed suggestions on how to make that work as good as possible. So um, that's it for this question, Andy. Thanks, Mishtak. Um, you touched on the importance of China as, as being one of the powerhouses behind the, the growth of the, the, the Asian international market. And it's also something that we, we've looked at in, in previous reports. Could you share some insights on, on the trends with respect to uh, the deal nationality? The, the underlying issuers. Uh, sure, why don't we go to the next slide? And by the way, I'll just mention that the figure numbers are from our paper. So uh, these are not typos. Uh, you can go to our, um, our, our paper and, and look at all the charts. We have not included all of them in, in this um, presentation. So actually we can go to the next slide. 
Okay, so by dual nationality, of course, as we've mentioned, um, China has been more and more of a, uh, a share of the um, overall issuance into um, uh, the overall inter international issuance. And, um, excuse me. So before 2010, um, you know, Japan and South Korea were probably the most active issuer countries. They took up more than 50% of the international issuances in Asia with relatively small international issuance from each country in the rest of Asia. And um, as mentioned, China basically had zero issuance, I think it's less than 10, 10 billion in um, 2006. But since 2010, there's been significant increase in issuance volume from China, um, including Hong Kong and ASEAN um, and India. So let's go to the next slide here. Okay, so this is just looking at China in particular. Um, there's been a rapid increase as you've seen, as you can see from the slide from 2010 to 2014. Um, that's been largely due to continued appreciation of RMB and low interest rates in US dollar funding markets, according to our research. And then from 2015 onwards, we've seen a bit more modest growth. It's been a little bit choppy, but these are um, interestingly largely a result of uh, not only international monetary decisions, so the Fed's decisions to raise interest rates, but also um, chi onshore Chinese regulatory requirements. So for example, NDRC filing, requir filing requirements and measures to restrict the sale of, of foreign debts, these sorts of onshore regulations affecting offshore issuance um, had a, a very interesting impact um, on the market. So the, I think the lesson to be learned here is that, again, there are all sorts of factors that affect this growth not just the economy, not just the issuers, not just the investors, but also the uh, regulations involved can have a, a big impact um, on, the, um, on the levels of issuance from year to year. Okay, next slide. Just take a quick look at India here. Um, you see the numbers are much smaller, so only um, around 20 billion uh, per year in annual issuance um, compared to over 200, 250 billion from China um, in recent years. But we have seen growth in India, again, it's been a little bit up and down, but this has mainly been driven by um, sort of onshore uh, economic uh, factors. So in India, one thing to note is that the um, issuance is largely driven by kind of large issuers, large seasoned issuers, uh, generally tend to be either um, major corporates or um, state-owned enterprises. So um, it's largely a function of, of their funding needs and of the international levels compared to the um, onshore levels. You see in particular the disruption from 2000, in 2018, the big drop there, that was basically caused by the shadow banking crisis and credit crisis in India. Um, we saw um, levels drop again in 2020, that was largely due to the pandemic, but actually the market is looking pretty healthy uh, so far in 2021. When I, when I say, I mean the international uh, bond market in India. Uh, next slide. Uh, we also looked at ASEAN a bit, and um, you see with ASEAN, of course, it comprises um, 10 countries in Southeast Asia, and the growth in the international bond market there has been fairly steady um, over the years and is, is relatively significant. Actually, if you look at current issuance out of ASEAN, um, international issuance, it's getting close to that of Japan, and it's uh, almost, um, almost reached the level of Japan. So we see, um, we'll see in just a bit, um, Japan issuance is, is relatively steady, but ASEAN issuance is growing quite a bit. Now, one thing to note about ASEAN is that we still think there's enormous potential for the international bond market in ASEAN. One factor that's a, um, particularly present in, in ASEAN, also in other countries, but also in ASEAN, is that corporate issuers still generally prefer domestic markets sorry, domestic borrowing in loans or bonds over international bond issuance. Um, this tends to be for a number of reasons, but usually it's just easier to raise money offshore, uh, sorry, onshore, the markets onshore are a bit more liquid, they're deeper, there's adequate demand, they're familiar with the investors. Um, and they can also, in some cases, sell to retail as well onshore, um, which is unlike the situation um, offshore. One other factor in ASEAN that contributes to a relatively low level of um, international issuance is that the corporates as um, in themselves are generally not as large as say Chinese or developed market corporates. And so their issuance sizes are gonna be small which makes that a little bit less attractive to international investors. Next slide, please. And I'll just touch upon Japan real quick. 
Um, so we've seen Japan issuance move up in accordance with the general Asian international uh, bond issuance. Um, Japan has a very long history, more than 100 years, actually, in the international bond market. Um, maybe next year we can go into a bit of that history some more. It's quite interesting. Um, but we did see, um, after the global financial crisis and the decrease in US dollar rates, the market gradually shifted away from the yen carry trade and, to a larger extent, reflected credit fundamentals, more realistic funding needs, um, and funding international business expansions. Thanks, Mushtay. <clears throat> Obviously, the, the development of, of any, any new market, the, the ability to attract debut issuance is, is critical. What does, the, what does the analysis show us with respect to, to, to new issuers coming to the Asia or international market? Yeah, sure. This is a really interesting one, actually. Oh, thank you for the slide. Um, so one thing that we saw, we noticed here in Asia is that um, a lot of the growth has been fueled by, by debut issuance. And what that, what that tells us is that it's not just um, existing issuers kind of issuing, getting bigger and issuing in, in bigger size. Every year, we've almost every year, we're seeing new issuers come into the market. So there's a steady inflow of um, fresh new issuers who have never issued before. Um, and this is also fueling the growth of, of the market. So I think that's a very important point for, for Asia. And I think it'll probably continue, although we see the, um, the percentage of the debut issuance slightly going down. The levels of debut issuance are still um, relatively high. So in the past 15 years, just to be precise, um, debut international issuance has accounted for 4 to 12% of all issuances in a year, um, with exceptions, of course, in the, uh, in the financial crisis. And the Chinese deals have been a, a very significant driving force. Actually, Chinese issuance has been 70% of all debut international issuances since 2011. Um, another interesting thing to note is that the majority of debut issuances are, are listed. So um, for, for several reasons, um, including um, investor preference, possibly um, potential extra governance, um, also perceived uh, extra disclosure, the debut issuers, as well as many of the seasoned issuers, are still choosing to list their bonds um, rather than issue um, unlisted issuances. Now, we're not getting into listing too much um, in this presentation, but that was an area where um, the market participants had quite different views um, about the reasons for uh, listing. But the, the data show, at the very least, that listing is the preferred method um, for uh, most of the international issuance um, out of Asia. So maybe maybe just to wrap up on the the primary aspects for now, um, would you be able to just provide a, just a brief overview of market structure in terms of currencies, deal sizes, tenors? Um, sure. So let's move on a little bit. Um, one next slide. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just talk about current. If you can go back one. Sorry. Yeah, there you go. So I'll just talk about currency a little bit. Um, for international issuances, no real big surprise here. Um, it's the G3 currencies that dominate. Um, the US dollar issuances make up 84% 84, 84 of all issuances. Um, and also you have Euro, um, Singapore dollar, and um, other currencies. Um, one thing I was just curious about is the uh, CNH market as well. And while we don't go into detail in the paper, um, you'll see from the, um, if you look very clearly, closely at the, at the chart, um, that CNH is a very small part of um, international um, bond issuance. And this probably would have, be a, would have been a surprise to someone um, you know, back in a time warp in 2010, 2011, when the uh, CNH market, when the offshore MMB market first started. I mean, as um, we can actually look at the kind of percentage of um, CNH as, uh, as a percentage of the overall Asian market. And of course, it was not really existent before about 20, 20, about 2008. But then around, from around 2010, 2011 to 2014, it actually got to about 10% of the overall international bond market. So this was CNH. And then it dropped significantly for a number of reasons. Um, again, that's probably an analysis for another time. But um, yeah, for those curious, um, it, there has been an interesting story um, over CNH and um, it has not emerged as a dominant currency in the international um, bond markets. 
All right, well, Andy, we've talked about primary markets quite a bit. So if you don't mind, I'm going to turn it around and ask you um, a bit about this secondary market. And in particular, I'm curious about the um, liquidity conditions in the secondary market. How have those evolved over time? And what are we seeing today? Yeah, well, thanks, Mushtaq. <clears throat> I said we could move the slides forward. Um, perfect. Actually, if we take one, one step back. Um, secondary markets, as, as Kenneth alluded to in, in his remarks, it's very difficult to get a full handle on, on secondary bond markets, uh, particularly as they're, they're very much OTC traded. So a lot of the analysis really comes through in the, in the interviews. Um, what we find is that, um, as is often the case, liquidity is, is generally in the, the, the eye of the beholder. Um, some, some market participants feel that liquidity in the, in the secondary market is extremely good. Others believe it is, it is relatively constrained, particularly compared to, say, the US market, um, which, which is understandable given the difference in, in size, which you, you showed earlier. Um, but there also seem to be more nuanced factors, such as uh, different liquidity profiles based on, on size of issuance, on um, the, the, the particular name, um, and, and also um, tenor can, can make a difference as, as well. Also, the, the prevalence of market makers. I mean, clearly, liquidity is very much contingent on, on the willingness for, for market makers to, to provide two-way prices. Um, what we also hear is that it's a very skewed market. Uh, because demand at, at, at issuance is, is particularly strong, um, because of the predominantly buy-to-hold nature of the investor base, there isn't a, a great deal of recycling. And, and demand does tend to, to outstrip supply. So in the secondary market, what we see is generally very good liquidity on, on, on the bid side, uh, less so on, on the offer side. But again, this, this really varies. And I think the, the, the data is, is interesting. So here we have some, some um, tracks data provided by Market Access, which shows traded volumes. And you can see this broken down by country of risk. And, and I think there are two, two key trends that, that can be observed from this. One, if you look at the, the, the green in the charts, that's China. Um, and and I, I think that really reflects what, what you've just outlined from the primary perspective, that China is very, very dominant um, in, in, the, in the secondary markets in terms of nationality of, of, of issuance. Um, the other point which I find interesting is if you look at the, the, the spikes in, in, in um, trading volumes, when you look at the beginning of uh, 2018, for instance, when you look at the summer of, of um, 2019, and in particular, when you look at February of, of, and March, of, or February in particular of 2020, as, as COVID started to, to, to hit, these, are, these, these correlate very closely with risk off trends in the market. So it, it does show that, um, that, that liquidity is there uh, to, to some degree when, when uh, the market turns. If we move to the next slide, which shows, um, which actually shows trade count, again, you, you, you can see that um, uh, it correlates very, very closely. Again, the dominance of, of China as the uh, uh, main secondary market product, um, but also the, the capacity for the market to, to provide liquidity during, um, during times of, of stress. All right. Let me ask you another question, Andy. And this came out in some of our uh, some of our qual qualitative research as well. What are the reason? What are the main challenges with liquidity um, in the Asian international bond market? Are they similar to that of um, Europe and the U.S. and other uh, more developed international bond markets, or um, are there particularities um, in the Asian context in terms of um, problems or challenges in, in ensuring adequate bond liquidity? That's a really interesting question. I, I think there are some, some similarities, but there's also um, some regional nuances. Um, clearly primary market, as, as I touched on, primary market structure plays a, an important role. So the, the number of, of issues, the size of issues, 
uh, a common uh, complaint, if, if that is the right word, from, from many of the interviewees was that one, there isn't enough issuance and two, the, the, the issues aren't big enough. Um, so there, there is this uh, supply skew, if, if you like. Um, tenor, as I touched on, also makes a difference. The, the general tenor of, of issuance tends to be shorter. Um, mm. A lot of investors would like to see that, that maturity profile pushed out uh, along, along the curve. The, the importance of market makers, I think that's a, a, a critical point. Uh, that's something that, that is, is inherent in, in, in liquidity provision across all bond markets, given the, the, the nature of the, the underlying market. And here we find an interesting trend. Historically, liquidity provision for market makers was very much split along the, the lines of the, the underlying nationality of the issue. So you'd have the Chinese houses providing liquidity in the Chinese names, Japanese houses in the Japanese names, et cetera. Even in the international um, issuance context. Absolutely. But now what we're, what we're beginning to see is the, the emergence of more pan-Asian um, names. So the names, so the underlying issue, uh, country of issuance becomes less relevant. And um, you, you, you'll have, and it's mainly through the, the, the larger international banks, but the, the traders will provide liquidity in, in it, whether it's IG or high yield, regardless of whether it's, uh, whether it's a, a, a Chinese corporate or um, a, a, an Indian SOE. Okay, well, actually, that's a good segue. You were talking about the investor perspectives. Uh, maybe we can talk about that um, for a little bit because we did um, some, uh, some analysis as well. Um, again, from the quantitative and qualitative aspect on investors. And if I could ask, um, please, to move the slides back. We skip one, one, two, keep going, keep going, keep going. There you go, thank you, stop, oh, next one. Exactly, thank you so much. Um, so I thought this was a very interesting analysis uh, personally, because it really highlights um, the um, advantages of combining qual quantitative and qualitative analysis um, in these sorts of questions. And um, one aspect from the geologic data was looking at um, the investor mix in terms of distribution. So Reg S and 144A. Now, for those of you who might not be familiar, um, Reg S is just jargon um, based on US regulation um, for deals that are sold outside of the United States. So avoiding the United States market for regulatory um, reasons. And 144A is a method by which you can get a safe harbor for sales um, into, into the, or you can, it facilitates sales into the United States. So basically if it's a Reg S deal, you generally exclude United States investors. If it's a 144A deal, you are including um, US institutional investors. And so you can get aggregate data on the distribution um, based on this uh, metric. And the appearance from the chart that you can see is that the percentage of Reg S only deals, meaning those that are um, issued not to US investors, but, gl but globally um, is increasing while those that are issued to US investors um, are, is decreasing. But that is not necessarily a correct conclusion, even though it appears that way from the data. When we're talking to the actual um, participants in the market, the actual reality is much more nuanced. So first of all, um, many of the international investors have a presence in Asia now when they didn't before. So you can't be sure that an Asian investor um, is not necessarily a US asset owner or a European asset owner. So that's one thing. So in some senses, it may be um, excluding some of the, um, the, the US investment, maybe overstating the amount to which um, international investors, particularly US investors, are, are being included. On the other hand, it is clear though that even for US investors, a lot of that can be Asian money. So um, it could go the other way around. And unfortunately, it's, it's a bit harder to get too deep into that. But the point is that um, the um, international investors have remained prominent in these international deals out of Asia, but also the share of Asian investors um, has also increased. So we're seeing a lot more kind of Asian investors interested in Asian deals, but we're also seeing an increase in the overall amount of international kind of US European investors um, interested in Asian deals from a sort of emerging markets um, 
standpoint. And um, yeah, so that's the point I'd like to make. I mean, Andy, did you have anything to add to that? No, and again, I think it, it, it's, it does play an important part in, in secondary market liquidity as well. And um, the nature of the investor. In fact, one of the one, one of the points that, that we should probably also talk about you know, with respect to secondary market liquidity is the the the, the availability of a, a, a repo market and also a, a CDS market. And again, from the repo market perspective, um, the investor base is 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 critical in terms of who is willing to to lend securities. In fact, if we if we move the slides forward a little bit. Okay, thank you. Um, so we were very, very much interested in the ability from, for, from a secondary market perspective, the ability for dealers to be able to, to both hedge and, and fund their, their inventory. And I'll, I'll just talk briefly about the, the CDS market. Um, Market makers uh, clearly hedge their interest rate risk using using futures or or swaps. Uh, their ability to to hedge credit risk is very much contingent on the CDS market. And what we find is, in terms of the the index CDS index, it's incredibly liquid. It's incredibly deep. Well, um, it's uh, as as a, a generic credit hedging instrument, it's, it's readily available. When it comes to single names, um, we find that market very much demise post Lehman. And there is very, very little liquidity in the single name market. Um, also, there are very few market makers, which also makes it very difficult to trade out of positions. So that seems to be one, one inhibitor on improve liquidity in the secondary market. The other one which is very interesting is the availability of a repo market. And what we have here are data provided by, by DataLend, which is a part of, part of Equilend and Bondlend, who uh, are a, a platform for lending securities into, into basically from agency lenders to, to dealers. Um, and this gives an indication of of the, the liquidity in that market. And what we find is that it's relatively stable, despite the, if you think of the earlier charts where we see this, this increase in, in the market. We also find that China, for instance, the amount of Chinese names set on loan is relatively low. And again, this goes back to the, the investor base and the willingness to lend securities. And what we tend to find is that the, the international lender base uh, the inter investor base tends to be more familiar with lending securities. Um, so we see a, a more supply coming into the market to help facilitate market making. But uh, the, the, the more regional buy to hold investors are, are, are less keen to lend out their, their holdings. And, and this also perhaps puts um, an inhibitor, if you like, on, on the ability of market makers, particularly in a, in a, a market where uh, investors are, are not particularly tolerant of, of settlement fails. So still some some room to grow in terms of market development as well and um, an increase in liquidity and infrastructure. Okay, I'm mindful of time. Um, we do uh, have um, time for Q&A. So if you have any questions, um, please put them um, in, the, um, in the Zoom platform and we'd be happy to do our best to answer them. Um, we do have one question, a little technical question from an anonymous um, attendee. Uh, what accounted for the larger issuance by the Philippines in one of our charts? Um, that's a good question, <laughs> the same one. Um, I, I understand that um, this is largely driven by um, uh, issuance from the ADB, uh, which is uh, technically um, a Philippines located um, issuer. And um, actually one thing that we should have mentioned is that we analyzed um, this location of the issuer in two different ways uh, for comparison purposes in the report. Um, one is by quote unquote issuer nationality, which is the um, legal entity location of the issuer. And the other is deal nationality, um, which is the um, place of operations and risk basically um, of, the, uh, of the corporation as determined by uh, deal logic. And um, for obvious reasons, we believe that the deal nationality um, is 
gives a more accurate picture um, of where the actual issuer is, particularly for Chinese issuances. If you compare the analysis by issuer nationality to that by deal nationality, you'll find that issuer nationality issuance out of Asia is actually significantly less than quote unquote deal nationality issuance out of Asia. The reason for that is that many Asian issuers will use a Cayman entity or, or, or non-Asian BVI or whatever um, entity to actually issue their bonds. So that's why we've looked at deal nationality. Um, but I think for ADB, um, however you look at it, it would be out of the Philippines. And so they're a very significant issuer in the international market. Um, I can look into that more um, if you send me an email or uh, contact us directly. Thanks. So we wish to, we've had a, another question come in on, on secondary markets and the, the uptake of platforms, trading venues, e-trading, which I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to take. It's something we, right. we, we cover in the report as well. Um, it's, it's definitely interesting, particularly when we look back at the report we produced in 2018, the, the uptake of e-trading in Asia, it certainly lagged, definitely like the US and, and to a large extent Europe, but it seems to be catching up. And what we find, particularly through the interviews, and it's, it's difficult to get percentages on, on, on the use of, say, e-trading compared to pure OTC. But what we find from the qualitative analysis is that whilst the adoption of, of e-trading is, is really, as, as it is in other markets, that the main driver is really about creating market efficiencies, it is becoming increasingly seen as a, a means to source liquidity. And, and while the Asian market is traditionally very relationship-based, um, and, and having a phone call with your, your salesperson is generally how business has always got done in the secondary right. markets. There is a lot more use now of, of the various e-trading protocols, whether it's RFQ, um, seeing a more all-to-all -all, um, functionality. And, and, and there seem to be a few reasons for this uh, as well. I mean, we talked about... Um, for instance, Bond Connect, um, and that's certainly been a, a catalyst for for more use of electronic trading. Um, also, with the the migration of swaps trading onto onto execution facilities onto onto sets, that's also helped familiarize market participants with 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 e trading. So, it looks as if it's it's beginning to catch up. It's, it has a long way to go. Um, we're also finding, particularly with the international, more international institutions who have become very focused on, on data capture and digitization and automation, uh, primarily through the, the, the US and European operations, we're also realizing that there's, there's great value uh, to be had here in, in the Asian markets as well. So we expect this to be a trend to continue and, and possibly something we'll look into more deeply in, in future reports. Sure, and I might add, Andy, Andy, that's definitely been a, a theme of our research is that the, the human touch um, in trading is still very much uh, the norm in Asia, um, probably a little bit different from, uh, from other regions at this point. But I think that Asian, the Asian markets are becoming more electronic, um, even secondary. Um, and also we're seeing um, some interesting developments, uh, not only by the exchanges themselves, but also by in, in the FinTech world um, that could in the long term um, certainly affect the way that uh, bonds are, are traded. Um, one interesting thing, and I think this is a very basic point, um, and I think uh, Kenneth Hoy alluded to this as well, um, is that even when you look at the role of exchanges for, for the bond markets, it's still largely about the listing, right? It's still largely about, uh, about getting those bonds listed for reasons that um, are probably a little bit different from um, pure liquidity or, or trading. Um, they're still generally traded OTC, but the listing provides other, um, other governance and other uh, um, comforts for, um, for those parties involved. Well, we're just about running out of time here. So thank you all for um, uh, your questions. Um, if you have further questions about our um, report, please feel free to contact us at ICMA and um, we'll do our very best to, to answer them. Um, we're actually very curious for your feedback as well um, on the analysis, particularly any places where you think it may be an error or it could be improved for next time and ideas for further analysis. Very happy to get your feedback there.
Now I'd like to hand it back over to the CEO of ICMA, Martin Scheck, for some closing remarks. Thank you, Martin. Well, thank you, Mushtaq, and thank you, Andy, for leading us through that, uh, that report. And as Kenneth said in his opening, the, the aim today has really been to, and with the report, has been to shed light on the operations of the OTC markets and to provide a, if you like, a, a conceptual framework for continued analysis to identify trends and developments. We've already seen a number of trends and developments. We heard a lot about uh, progress in market developments. We heard a lot about the evolution of the issuer base, the evolution of the investor base. And of course, we saw starkly illustrated on the graphs the, the, the pivotal role played by Hong Kong and China in this. And I think it's interesting to note that Hong Kong is the leading center globally for the arrangement of Asian deals. And perhaps that's not surprising, given that 40% of the deals are, are emanating from, uh, from Chinese issuers. So we, we analyzed the, the drivers of growth in the markets. Uh, I also found it interesting to just hear about the, the five-fold increase from 2006 to 2020. And it's particularly interesting to see where growth is coming from. Of course, we've just mentioned China, but it's not exclusively China. It's also Japan, it's uh, India, and it's ASEAN since uh, 2010. And we then spent some time looking at the secondary markets, uh, a little bit more opaque than the, uh, the primary markets, uh, looking at some of the uh, um, issues around uh, trading liquidity, some of the challenges that we were facing in analyzing these. But again, I think when you look through that and you look at the graphs that we've presented, the, the dominance of uh, China is, uh, is clear. And it's, it's also interesting to hear what the challenges are to secondary market liquidity. And we heard about the, the supply and demand imbalance at the moment, the um, relatively modest issue sizes, and also a, a little bit of uh, comment on market maker capacity in what is essentially a, um, um, an RFQ market, which is intermediated by market makers where that capacity is important. So I think there's a lot to pick up today um, in this, and we've only had time really to scratch the surface in the last hour of all of the detail that's in the report. So we do urge everybody to take a good look through this report and uh, try to make sense of the, um, uh, the graphs that we put in there and look at the trends for yourselves. So all that remains for me to do really is to thank again the HKMA for their support. We're very much looking forward to continuing to work uh, with you and uh, um, repeat the iterations of this report so we can continue to look for trends uh, going forward. Um, very much uh, like to thank the, the data platforms for the provision of such high quality data. We couldn't have done it without you. And of course, the, the market participants that we as Andy mentioned, that we um, held these semi-structured interviews, the um, both qualitative and quantitative input that you were able to give us really uh, provide tremendous insights in helping us analyze the data. And finally, thanks to all of you for uh, participating today. I do hope that you found it interesting um, and it gave you a flavor of what's actually in the report. Um, as Mushtaq just mentioned, we are very much available to answer questions. And of course, we, we particularly welcome suggestions and comments as to how we can uh, develop this, uh, uh, this report as we uh, uh, undertake future iterations. Mm -hmm.